Hello everyone, this is Jennifer with Peoria Business Chance. I'm here today with John and Caroline LaHood. Uh, we're going to talk about all kinds of neat things uh, from family business to startup and uh, adventures and family dynamics and business. But first of all, I wanted to welcome, welcome you guys to the show. Thank you. Would you first um, like to start off by just taking a couple minutes and just telling us about your yourselves and like where you grew up and all that good stuff? Yeah. Um, I'm Caroline LaHood. John and I have been married for almost 14 years now. Um, we're both from the Peoria area, but we didn't meet until we went to school at the University of Illinois in Champaign. <laughs> so um, we met my freshman year, like first day, and we got married two weeks after I graduated. Aww. Um, yeah, so we've been together through a lot. Um, and we, um, in addition to the startup life that we're currently doing, we also run um, John's family's business, Lagandola Spaghetti House. So we've been doing that for 15 years now. Um, so yeah, balancing restaurants, four kids, and building a startup. And how about you? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's um, like Caroline said, it's been kind of a journey The you know, I think balance work life, especially working with uh, family is, is, it's important to be mindful of you know, what you're doing, how you're doing it, but it's uh, overall, yeah, it's been a great experience all the way around. Um, we work with my brother and my dad closely with the restaurant and um, and they've been really fabulous bosses to, you know, allow us to do this venture on the side. And um, yeah, it's been a really fun experience and a fun journey. Is your dad still with us? Yes. Um. So there's a lot, you guys are in a lot of different projects. So uh I want to get into all of that, but I wanted to start with like the beginning. Your dad started this, what, 41 years ago, 42 years ago? Yeah, that sounds good. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He's done a lot. Even before La Gondola, he had teenage nightclubs and laundry, laundromats and different, another pizza place, La Hood Pizza. So um, he has definitely has a ton of experience that he brings to it. Um but yeah, very, very interesting man. And just the tenacity, we're just to keep sticking with small businesses, which is yeah. just a tough route yeah. all the time. Yeah. But we've been so lucky to watch him and have him, you know, guide us through our journey. So you grew up in the entrepreneurial family. What was your childhood like? Were you, uh, what kind of kid were you? Yeah, so I grew up in a family that was very nine to five. My dad is a teacher, okay. a high school teacher in the area. And my mom um, was able to balance stay at home and working on the side bookkeeping, which is actually what I do for the family too. So kind of followed her route of just always kind of working from home and having those big green ledger books all over. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, the entrepreneurship is always completely new to me. My dad always says he admires how brave John's family is to just take these routes that are kind of uncharted. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of advantages to that. And there's a lot of disadvantages to that kind of family life. Mm -hmm. We, I grew up having dinner on the table at five o'clock. Our kids usually eat like at 830 at night with restaurants, you know, we try to always eat together no matter what. So definitely a different route. Yeah, mm -hmm. different lifestyle for sure. So did you have any um, like lemonade stands or any sales in your? Oh, I'm life? sure. Yeah, I've always been definitely a go-getter. Um, I was always on student council and things like that, which maybe put me in the mindset to recognize when John kind of drags me along something else. <laughs> sometimes I drag him into something. Sometimes he drags me into it. Um, but we like to, both of us like to stay busy. And I think we've always been like that since we were little. In most family businesses, the kids get dragged in pretty early. What what age did you start working in the family business? I'd say early on in high school was when I really started working regularly. But he was, in, there's pictures of him in before. <laughs> <laughs> trying to boss everybody around. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite part of the business? Um, the business, um, I, I would say it's become sort of the, um how to say it like the the schedule you know early on i would say it was difficult being always working on the weekends and working nights mm -hmm. um because that's when people are normally off but i think i've come I've grown to like that i've enjoyed being off you know in the mornings and sometimes in the afternoons and having that schedule where you work at night and work weekends um and then probably just because you get used to it after a while but it's just it's like it's ours it's like it's our schedule and um it, it's just kind of fun being different than what everybody else is doing, I think. Yeah, and you get to kind of 
being an entrepreneur, you kind of get to make your own rules and do your own projects. Yeah. And yep, everything. for sure. And and you get to, especially having a side project like this, you get to, um, you get that time to work. You know, you you get to schedule out your mornings and do things on your own time um, for something like Color Forge or other side projects that we've worked on in the past. Mm -hmm. This morning, my um, kindergartner, aka we call him Last Baby, that's <laughs> yeah. that's it. But um, he forgot something, and I was able just to take it till next school. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Just having that flexibility of being an entrepreneur. It's definitely a price to pay, like you said. Yeah. It's a lot yeah. of responsibility, but yeah. I can't imagine working for anybody else. I think that's how we are too now. Yeah. yeah. So you you got you came into the family restaurant, you were working on that. How did Color Forge come about? It's it's one of my favorite stories to tell. <laughs> so some of the background is that yes, Jen has seven sisters. And one yeah. brother, and they're all very artistic people. Um, so his sisters are amazing at makeup. So he grew up with a lot of makeup, um, and always kind of waiting for his sisters to finish getting out of the bathroom. Um, so he was always exposed to it, and he's also just a maker. I don't want to talk too much about that, but he always has some crazy craft or side project he's doing. We have a lot of expensive toys, I would say, like laser cutters and CNC machines, a couple three D printers. Um, so when we we had our we got married and had three kids right away so after our third we wanted a getaway and we ended up in hell's kitchen at a 3d print conference with a six-month-old baby oh, wow. um which new york city is that was my first time in new york city and it wasn't super baby friendly um but while he was at this conference which it was a really good getaway um he had the idea i want to explain the background yeah it was um yeah they they had these binder jet printers they're printing food using these FDNC grade dyes. Mm -hmm. And it was, in my mind, it was sort of a short leap to think that you could use these same uh, fluid materials to create cosmetics using a different- Why cosmetics? We had, you know, I think it was mostly my brother and my father and my sister tears. I had this idea many years before for um, for a makeup applicator, like a, like a friction uh, one-step makeup applicator that was essentially makeup on a cellophane substrate that you applied you know all your makeup at one time okay. and it was always a joke in our family and uh one year tears and made like a very rough prototype for my dad for christmas and she put it on in front of the family and we were like all shocked how well it worked <laughs> and uh so they decided to pursue it a little bit so they um tried to get a patent on it and spent years doing that and ended up it wasn't patentable um, but I think that was always just sort of in the back of our minds, like, hey, I wonder if this could ever work. So I think originally looking at 3D printing, I saw um, how did you make that happen? Exactly. Yeah. Being able to print like a bespoke complex geometry in a 3D printer, you know, unique to somebody's face. You could actually print this, use this um, process to print this product that was already in my head. So you deal with direct to consumer. Customers. So no, we we definitely pivoted from that oh, okay. point. Yeah. So I think from there, John realized additive manufacturing is a very agile manufacturing process. So from there, it went from creating these custom masks, okay, to just creating makeup like powder, cosmetics, eyeshadow, blush. Um, you're just using the raw cosmetic powders that are already used. Traditional like product in a pan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just pivoted from that to just doing something super unique, which we can still create bespoke products, but very agile and inclusive and sustainably. So from from Hell's Kitchen visit, how long after that did you guys start so, putting things into motion? Yeah, so that was our third son, Clark, and he's nine years old now. So it's been about nine years. Um, right after we got back, John started looking and to do some background on Binder Jet. Manufacture all these patents. It's a twenty. Now it's probably a thirty-year-old process. Mm -hmm. Um, all these patents were expiring though in two thousand ten mm -hmm. and on, and so that's why three D printing really took off in the last oh, ten wow. years or so because the patents were available. Now okay. you could use use the process. So John got on eBay and he found a twenty-five-year-old Z Corp printer in Kentucky, right? For five thousand dollars, so we loaded up the same baby okay. <laughs> into um, a borrowed truck mm -hmm. and trailer, and we went down to Kentucky, and they were selling it on a horse farm. And I had the baby in the car while John spent five hours with a notebook, just learning how to run this twenty-five-year-old printer. Right? Yeah, 
Yeah, no, and looking back, it was kind of crazy because it, it was <laughs> the machine was finicky to put it lightly. There was a lot of tricks to get it, keep it running. It's one of those basically. cars that only you know how to start. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so we worked on that machine for about three years in the basement and we were able to slowly learn how to sort of hack the materials to create what we wanted. And it was even trickier than that because we had to use that machine didn't have enough print channels to do what we wanted to do. So we essentially had to um, cancel out what we do is we print structure adjacent to a cosmetic product. So what that ends up looking like is a hard structural pan around a consumable cosmetic product. Mm -hmm. um, That's bi biodegradable, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so the um, so what we ended up having to do was actually cancel out the first binder with the with the colored binders in order to try to create that dual structure. So it was actually even more complicated than what we're doing now, which is just separate um, binder channels to do exactly what they're purpose built to do. Um, so that was years sort of getting to a very rough prototype, which we finally did, um, which kind of just kicked us to the next stage uh, where we bought a, um, a Taiwanese binder jet printer and a company called Microjet that was able to offer us custom firmware and software to get their print channels to um, print the way that we wanted to, a, you know, a structure adjacent to a cosmetic. Um, and then from there, it was just putting in the right materials. Um, spent a couple of years on that system and uh, sort of learned everything we need to actually do this it right. It just took you a couple of years because you're still running your other businesses. Oh, yeah. He would... Um, work all night or you know dinner shift and come home eat dinner put kids to bed and go down until four in the morning and our whole house was covered in these paper plates with just different samples of products there's all over the house um, anytime that like we had someone a workman come down to our basement it was full of like powders and like shady looking equipment and I'm like no 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 it's all legal yeah. it's all legal down here um, but yeah it was years and during that time too he filed for a patent um, and he wrote the patent for the most part. Well, we had attorneys help him, but John really, he's self-taught and all mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I read that about you. In, in yeah, and so he was able to put that together and file for um, a patent, and that was in 2014, and it was approved in 2018. It's a very long process, but to get approved for that from our basement, and at the time we were living in Washington, mm -hmm. was really cool, a big achievement. So one of the reasons why I started this podcast is because I feel like there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there, and it's a very, like, lonely like, game. Yes. <laughs> um, and I feel like um, sometimes people will look at someone successful, and they'll think, like, it almost happens, like, overnight or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure it, during these times, both of you probably had points where you felt like giving up, or is this even worth it? Oh, Can definitely. you talk about that and what you did? To... Yeah, no, I think it's it happens a lot. Um, and I think the the mindset to keep going is, is kind of a gift. And um, I, I've heard Caroline describe it that way. And it's, mm -hmm. it is, it is challenging at times. And for me, it's it's sort of a cyclical routine. You know, there, there are times when we'll hit a roadblock and I'll get frustrated for like a day and maybe I won't work for a day or two, but then I'll, it'll always sort of come back to, I'll have that hunger to get back to work and get back to, you know, achieving the goal. And um, do you then, feel like that time, uh, take a step back is uh, helpful to you to like clear your mind and like see a solution or just because you're too frustrated and nothing good's going to come from it yeah no i do <laughs> i do think it's helpful to step back and take a bigger look and and also just you have to take a break every once in a while too um but yeah no yeah i think the struggle is real i think that the not that not that we're successful yet but i think that the, the path to success i think this type of story is the rule not the exception i think you read about um, successful business ventures and it almost always goes you know, on a very long journey yeah. that's difficult yeah. bankruptcies yeah. yeah and we were like everyone else where in 2014 we we're like oh by 2015 we'll be doing this this um and here we are in 2023 and but the route we took although it was very you know winding i look back on things that fell through and i thank god they did fall through you know they weren't the right decision yeah. at the time or the right situation and then the best part of all this is our kids have been watching this whole time and they they're very proud they're very invested and they've they've gone through the hard times where it was you know we thought we were done and then they watched john kind of climb back up every time and i think that the character formation that they're gaining from this is the best gift yeah. color forge is giving us don't you feel like that's a recent um, perspective for parents because it yes. used to be 
you better have straight A's or yes. it was all about academics. But I think a lot of parents are seeing now like there's other have, there's different, different kinds of kids. Yeah, and different ways of learning. Um yeah, if if you don't learn maybe traditionally ways, I think schools are starting to recognize that and encourage more of, you know, the arts or different ways of reading even or programming. I'm really, really blown away by mm-hmm. how much has changed since we were in school, which mm-hmm. just hasn't really been that long. Or maybe it has been. <laughs> Feels like it was just yesterday. <laughs> I just feel like, yes, five years, the best decade. Yeah. <laughs> when year did you graduate um, high school? High school, I actually was 05. So okay. Yeah. It's 2000. So. Yeah. Yeah. And he's a year ahead of me, but that's the polite way to find out how someone is. Yeah. You got to do a lot of math. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, they say, I think 95% of family owned businesses fail. So, um, there's two family dynamics. I want to ask you guys about the husband and the wife and then the, uh, brother and father. So, mm-hmm. um, can you guys speak to either of those? Yeah, the um, the my family dynamic, my brother and my father at La Grandola, um, to put it simply, we're just really fortunate. We're, we have um, a great familial relationship. Uh, my brother, Richard, is my best friend. Uh, my dad is my best friend and uh, the greatest mentor I've ever had. Um, and we... It, we're just very blessed. I, I see a lot of those family businesses where things, you know, have a tendency to end in a fight. And I've never really felt that temptation to to have that. And I think that's um, because of my, mostly because of my dad, the way that he approaches business, the way that he approaches family. Uh, your family's always first. And, um, you know, the, the support, you know, that going back to that trip to New York City, he was the one that pushed us to go on that trip. And, mm-hmm. you know, he says, you know, for our marriage more than anything, he said, you guys get, go get yeah. away. Go yeah, ahead. he was like, get away. Yeah. So, um, so my dad, he's always been there um, as a great mentor and a great um, example of, um, as a, of a dad and a, um, a husband. And uh, same with my brother, Richard. He's he's um, 17 years older than I am. So in some ways, he's a father figure for me as well. Sure. And, um, and I think that helps our relationship too, because he's always just been, um, he, he, on your wing, kind yeah, of he gives me advice and everything. And I think that that's, and he's always right. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, very, very fortunate. And then as far as like the husband and wife, I always say that it's not just color forge and it's just not Lagandola. It's also, we're like running a business with our household sure. too. Um, so it is definitely a lot to balance, but it's all we've ever known is the small business. Um, but it really sets, I think my parents, I always watched them and they were a team. They're just so much a team. And I always wanted that. And I think everything we do, we have to talk to each other and communicate and all these things that lead to a successful marriage. We have to also do for a successful business. That's a good point. Yeah. So it's kind of like we're forced into probably too much communication or too much time. Um, but like you said too, like we're also best friends. We were friends before we started dating. So I think if you can balance all those different relationships and different roles in each other's lives, it's not always easy, but luckily we don't get sick of each other either. Yeah. So, so is that something you intentionally do, like have the communication or the, the set, a, set aside, uh, I can't talk, set aside time to talk about issues or is it like a maintenance thing? Or? Yeah, no, I, it should be probably, but I think it would be nice if we had more dividing lines of like okay now it's lagandola time to talk and now it's color forge time we're a little bit better about color forge like okay we have a preschooler so now she's off at school so these are our times for meetings and um things like that or we'll go to a coffee shop and get out of the house right. because even the lagandola bookwork is happening in our house payroll and things like that um but i think we've just learned like you know through bad times and good times like what works and what doesn't work so. okay you um kind of already answered one of my questions, but um, I'm interested to see what your answer is as well. But who is your biggest mentor? Yeah, even your dad definitely had everything. I mean, it could be a Lagandola purchase. It could be, a, you know, we need to pull a kid's tooth out. John's dad is always like that. Um, but I think my parents have always been my biggest mentor too. Again, like I, I wanted what they had growing up. I loved how they treated each other with respect and teamwork. Um, and they instilled in all my siblings and I just this really hard work ethic, which even at the time, I don't think a lot of kids were growing up with. Yeah. Um, 
so but oh and with that we both come from very faith backgrounds like we, we're both catholic and okay. um i think that helps yeah you with the 10 kids and <laughs> yes yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah and but like we um, met at actually the catholic dorm down at oh. u of i so um i think when you have that aspect of you know faith and moral compasses growing up both of us we had kind of the same you know expectations yeah. and um we're on the same page with our kids too which helps a lot yeah yeah that's awesome mm -hmm. so and your biggest mentor has been your dad yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um what is the biggest challenge that you guys have had to overcome in business mm -hmm. Um, the color forge business, or either, either, whatever comes yeah. to mind. Um, the as far as La Gondola, it's uh, that business has been so well established for such a long time. It was when I got out of college, it was basically a a turnkey business for me to just step into a role. Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of the hardship was taken out of that for me, you know. And uh, Richard and Dad really did all the work, and really all the work of establishing a brand for years ahead of that. Um. With Color Forge, I think it's been a series of different, I describe it like a roller coaster. It's like there's been some incredible highs and some incredible lows. And, um, you know, there was, I'm trying to think of specific there's examples. Just, there's been a lot of no's and a lot of not understanding what we do. I think but just the doors that keep getting shut. It's so cliche, but really another challenge. one will open. Mm -hmm. But part of it is like going to look for that door, you know, and thank goodness one door like I said one door closed and a better one opened mm -hmm. and it's also just having the understanding at the time that okay and you know this wasn't what was intended it's got to go somewhere else I would say the last couple of years have been tough with COVID yeah, and yeah restaurants um we've been so fortunate from the beginning as difficult as it was to balance like e-learning and running Color Forge, keeping Color Forge going, and my kids were not interested. No, <laughs> and we ended up buying a house like in March 2020. So we were renovating a house, and um, we were really fortunate at Lagandola. We have just the best staff because they not only allow us to do this to be here today, mm -hmm. um, but at the time we were able to keep the doors open and keep going. Um, but the, there's been a lot of good lessons, a lot of good pivoting that we've had to do, like every small business the last couple of years. And that translated to Color Forge. Um, we lost some cool opportunities, I think, because, because of the shutdown. Of with mm -hmm. Yeah, we were supposed to be in Paris in March 2020. But the cool part is we actually just got back from Paris last week. Um, we were able to go back three years later, and he had won an award. And it, That's why you text me at 3 in the morning. Yes, I was sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> he thought about that afterwards. <laughs> we were in Paris. <laughs> we're still a little jet lagged. Nine out or... Super early. Definitely that too. But. <laughs> so um, when you said that the restaurant business was like turnkey and you just kind of walked into it, but you had your own ideas and your own things that you wanted to do. Um, have you been able to do that yet? And if so, um, what advice would you give to maybe a son or a daughter uh, coming up in a family business that wants to like kind of do their own thing? put their own footprint on the business. Yeah, you know, I. it's interesting because I I think I was, oh, for the most part, was always able to see La Gondola as a great opportunity. And even coming out of college, I knew that's what I wanted to do. That's, you know, that's what my brother went to the University of San Francisco and came home and okay. worked with my dad and started running, helping him run the family business. And I wanted to do the same thing. So it was, um, so I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. But at the same time, I think what I talked about earlier with the with the schedule and having free time, you know, during mornings and like when other people are at work, mm -hmm. I think that was sort of what was in my head where you you can have a passion project um, and sort of budget time to do to work on. You know, at the time, I don't even know what I was doing. Uh, I had a CNC router and was working on, you know, personalized gift products. And I wanted to create an Etsy store and I wanted to. And then that's one of the things we were looking at. In New York it, City, yeah. they, there was a carbon fiber 3D printer that I really wanted to check out. I thought there were some cool applications for custom gifts. Um, but for me, so it was always just um, sort of the desire to to make and to make things with my hands. And um, so I guess trying to answer your question, uh, the advice to somebody who wants to pursue something other than what they're doing, I think it just comes down to... Um, 
you know, prioritizing your your job number one, but also making time to you know follow your passions. And even if that's just learning, you know, for so many years, Wikipedia was my best friend, just mm -hmm. learning about chemically bonded ceramics and you know the ingredients that go into product, you know, cosmetic production and um, and you can do that now on your phone, which is, you know, probably not how it was, you know, when my dad was growing up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. What about you? Um, that's a good question. A lot of La Gondola is, if it's not broke, we don't fix it because it has been such a successful business. And I think I've, I actually went to University of Illinois and studied hospitality management. So I've never had a job outside of restaurants. Um, so I really love my father-in-law's mentality of um, simple mm -hmm. and not overextending. And to be boots on the ground and watch him do that in a local way was huge. There's been things we've had to add over the years. And I, I think I pushed it through you know, like online ordering or DoorDash simply became a necessity. Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to help spearhead those things because it was closer to things I understood. Um but as far as the rest of it goes, we keep our menu simple. We've learned to not overextend. What people like. Well, yeah. we know what people like. Um, you know, I grew up going to Leonardo's, too. Mm -hmm. We should say it's Pierre mm -hmm. Lagandola and Leonardo's. So yeah. John's dad had started the original Leonardo's way back in the day and then sold it and went on to um, Lagandola. So it's always so fun to have someone come in and they said, oh, I used to come here. We had our first date in that booth. Aww. And to be like, oh, well, my father-in-law was running it at the time. And that's my husband in the kitchen. And that might be my son over there folding pizza boxes. Yeah. You know, we're very, we take a lot of pride in how local we are and how family run we are, still are. A lot of businesses that have been around a long time, I feel like they are family owned businesses. Yeah. Ravers, Trexpers. Exactly. Agatushi is, and they, they know what works. I think there's a lot of beauty in just sticking to what works. Mm -hmm. You do have to pivot. Like I said a little bit, the last couple of years thrown more at this industry than ever before, but still sticking close to your roots. And not only that, but I think that taking the shortcut, the quality is what you'll see in all those other restaurants or those other family businesses. They stick to the quality and not the shortcuts, and that pays off in the long run. And it's your family name on it. Mm -hmm. It's your, your legacy. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, we've been lucky that we have a lot of family that works for us or people who have become family. And so our employees carry that same kind of value in every customer. Hopefully every sets customer the tone. service. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. it sets the tone. And I think people pick up on that. Do you, do you guys own the one in Key Wand? Or did you? So, yeah, my father does, he sort of yeah. owns and he has operating partners at every store. So we're essentially the operating partners at the Peoria store. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And Kiwani is also a family member up there too. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it is definitely a big family operation. I just told Did you? Yeah. Okay. And we used to go there and get the big thing of spaghetti and yeah. like sandwiches, torpedoes, yeah. I think. It's all the same mm -hmm. still. Yeah. Okay. It's been there for a while, but it's all the same. We have, we found old menus way back in the day of like Leonardo's. Or the first family feast, and the prices will just really blow your mind. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, I was just talking about, um, like you guys are in the hospitality business, mm -hmm. but I also think that no matter what business that you're in, a tire store or whatever, um, I almost think that having that mindset of treating your customers with a ho hospitality mindset mm -hmm. goes a long way. If you think about like a good experience, you know, mm -hmm. they, a company that just took care of you from beginning to end, I think that you guys have done that really well over the years. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that I think that's so true. And carrying that probably into like Color Forge too, I think we are we think of everything from beginning to end as an experience. Yeah, and I think it's also, yeah, it's definitely hiring the right people and people who want to be there and want to provide that service and. Got, I'll give a shout out to Wiley Knight, who's been with us for how 15 years? No, going over, up. over that. Um, Probably coming up on 20. I think you, you recognize what people are good at. And the first day you can see Wiley is, and everybody who goes to our store will know Wiley because he's always sort of the guy working the front. And you recognize that he's really good at, he loves to deal with customers. He loves to provide good customer service. And so we, you know, so Wiley, stay on the register. That's that's what you're good at, you know. And uh, so that's part the of it too. The register is like, that's the front line. That's the mm -hmm. interaction with the customers. That's the face of the business. Like being yeah, that's, exactly. that's an important yeah. position. So who's the disciplinarian when it comes to employee uh, oh, yes. and all that? I'm definitely like the nice guy in 
they they come to me first um and i am i'm such a pushover the path of least resistance i Carolina. am i am i don't think i've ever disciplined anybody <laughs> but we're very fortunate and that it's such a rare occasion for us but i really mean it i think we've been there for 15 years and we've had employees that we've had years where we just don't even have any turnover wow. we're so lucky again the last couple of years have been harder but we've fared so much better than most people and i think it's you know we're a family run like we're in there with the kitchen with them for the most part a little bit less these days with color forge mm-hmm. taking us but um leading by example is the biggest thing you can do well and there definitely have been i think we were we did so well with turnover for so many years and then once the in the COVID era we did we lost so many people and we actually had to close Mondays for a while because of that. We just could not staff it like so many other area restaurants. Um, but at this point where we really are back now, it feels like we're back open on Mondays and we have a, a really strong crew. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned earlier that when you have the right person and if you're in the right position, how important that is. What about when you have someone, they may be new or new into position, and you just kind of like it starts like with a little feeling that maybe they're not the right fit. What do you do? It's a good question. I mean, I think it all starts with we're very, very intentional in our hiring process. Um, but I've learned so many of our employees when they first started, I remember being like, I don't know. <laughs> but I think it's working with them and training with them and seeing what talents they have and then finding that position. Mm-hmm. And they so many have really blossomed. I mean, we're lucky where we get maybe high school kids and mm-hmm. looking back like the last 10 years, what they've done with their lives. And not to say that we had anything to do with it, but, you know, just having just the expectations mm-hmm. of like, OK, this is what we expect from you. This is what we think you're good at and make it your own. And that goes a long way, I think, in raising this next generation. And if they're kind of like not getting it, just would how long do you guys sit on it before you say something? Or what's your yeah. approach? I mean, not everybody works out, but I will say I think we're more patient than most in that area. And those types of things, those types of disciplines can be learned, and we've seen that time and time again, mm-hmm. uh, you know, successfully. That these these kids again, they'll come in and you think, oh, I don't know if this is going to work out, and then those people turn into some of our best employees. You know, doing you know doing the same thing every day and learning, learning the discipline and learning, you know, it, it's, I'm almost surprised sometimes to see how, how far um, somebody can go. I think, yeah, I, I'm definitely more apt now to give second, third chances because we it's paid off for us, but you can always just, you know, send someone to dishes and <laughs> we don't have a dishwasher. So everything's hand washed. Oh, wow. um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, even if someone has to start on just doing dishwasher and climbing the back up from there, that's usually, I think, the best. Go to your very basic, mm-hmm. and maybe that's not for them, and maybe they'd make that decision to leave, um, but dishwasher is usually the baseline. <laughs> yeah, just start over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You said something um, that I thought was a good point, too, of, like, your hiring is very intentional, so mm-hmm. what's your hiring, hiring process like, and what do you look for? Who does the hiring? Usually, I think it's a combination. John does more of the interviews. Um, we've learned that references mean a lot. And by that, almost that we take, um, if an employee has a recommendation, we usually, that means a lot to us. Or a family member says, mm-hmm. I think someone will fit in well. Um, but yeah, sitting down with someone is the best way to really make a judge of someone. Not even just like what's on their application or their experience or Maybe they didn't have a, pa- a good past experience with another boss. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think John's a really great judge of character. So when he usually can sit down with someone and he sees something good in them or some drive in them, from there, I think that's usually when we make the decision to just try them out. I'll, and I think I like how we do it. It's just we say, you know what, come work a shift and see how it works. Sometimes we love them, but it doesn't work for them. Mm-hmm. And then they have that kind of freedom. Yeah. Um, but that's always really worked out for us, right? I think to be an employer, you have to really have that good sense of character and and maybe see through something rough on the outside. But just as long as someone's willing to work and you see the good in them, you know, they can start not great and they can be our best employees soon. We've seen that happen. And it's so expensive to hire and train people. Like yeah. really, you know, I really love what you said. 
and it makes me think of something my husband would say. It's just like, well, you know, starting from the beginning, just being intentional. Make mm-hmm. sure you have the right people mm-hmm. and then working with them because it's expensive. It is. We went, Advertising, time. Yeah. You know. Yeah. We went through some crazy times with <laughs> the Indeed we were using it oh, oh, yeah. during like the darkest <laughs> times of trying to hire and like right after covid yes. yeah and um we would put out we'd pay a lot of money to do these indeed ads and we'd have like maybe 15 people sign up for an interview john would slot them in and he would go sit there in the booth and all 15 wouldn't come and it's like it's hard not to take that personally yeah it was tough that was like, really tough since i've gotten better i haven't been hiring for a while. i got lucky with cammy yeah <laughs> she seems great yeah we don't use that service anymore we don't yeah <laughs> no i think we go back to a lot of referrals and um we actually have customers too will come in and say hey i've got a son who's looking for a job yeah. or things like that we've really learned to just the people who come in and they want to talk to us and that's the best way yeah don't go looking online necessarily yeah, yeah i agree yeah so um just a quick story. So I had an ad on Indeed, and I kind of had like the same thing. But this this was like December, January ish, and I had um, asked this guy to come in for an interview, and he uh, said he wasn't interested or what have you, but his wife was, and that was Cammy, oh, and great. she came in, and we oh, we just clicked. Mm-hmm. She she's flexible enough to like roll with me and like. I changed my mind and you know yeah. whatever and she's just kind of like all right mm-hmm. yeah i think so. jobs have changed so much now like flexibility is the best way to go yeah which is for us too with um color forge and also lagandola like sh- you know things change every week shifts are always different and i think a lot of our employees like the flexibility um it does make it hard to make a schedule but that's worth it yeah <laughs> That's rest, restaurant life, though, right? Yeah. The schedule is, I remember being a teenager in early 20s, like, working yeah. restaurant jobs. It was all about the schedule. Yeah. yeah. And they came out. It's like a giant Tetris game, <laughs> bending everything in together. <laughs> is there anything that we didn't cover that you guys wanted to mention? Mm-hmm. I know you have a lot of goals for Color Forge. What does that look like in the next yeah, year so, or two? Yeah, um, so Color Forge right now, we're finishing out our prototype. Our prototype printer is finished. Um, we're working on an eyeshadow demonstrator product. So right now, you know, you talk about COVID supply chains. We're, we are waiting on a hardware um, hardware upgrade for a print head. So we're a little bit stalled out on that, but using the opportunity to just keep growing, making connections where we can. Um, so really focusing on that. So I think within a couple months, we'll have that product. Yeah, and that that's that um, demonstrator product is what we've been working towards liter- for years, literally. So I think once we're and that so that is essentially um, a makeup product using all of the same materials that are currently used in the industry to make products. Um, so once we have that, that should be a big step for us, and we're planning on um, hopefully going going trying to establish a brand partner at that time and um, establish a go to market strategy, establish um, a strategy to scale up printer production to enable the manufacturing to go to market. Um, so that's, I think um, we're coming up on this um, stage where I think we're going to start to put a lot of things into motion, hopefully. Exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep pushing forward. I think that's the name of the game, really. So we've talked about two different businesses. So let's go with the restaurant. Where can people find you guys at online or at your physical location? Yeah, so we're at 700 East War Memorial, right across from Alwyn's, which is another family-owned Lebanese restaurant. Um, And our hours are Monday through Saturday, 11 to 9. We're closed on Sundays. Um, And online, we're at PeoriaLagandola.com. So yeah, we have a drive through window. Um, I always recommend trying our pizza. All our bread is baked fresh every morning by our bakers. Nothing's ever frozen. Um, and yes, pizza. I grew up on that pizza <laughs> and now I get to have that pizza whenever I want, which is a problem. <laughs> and Color Forge, you can find us at uh, 3dcolorforge.com and you can also um, follow us on LinkedIn. And in Instagram. I'm following yeah. Right oh now. yeah. I need to do a better job on <laughs> posting on that, but yeah, yeah, it's a good reminder. Um, yeah, no, it's just a great balance. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you for your tech, tech support. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that's uh, this episode of Peoria Business Champs. Um, if you're not already, please follow us on our Facebook group, Peoria um, Business Champs, and also on YouTube. Thank you to everyone that's watching and again to our guests. If you guys have any questions or comments, please leave them below.